Um, well, welcome. Uh, I, uh, as I think some of y'all know, uh, my name is Andrew Schultz. I'm a PhD student at Georgia Tech, and I'm studying African elephant uh, bio-inspired design with the elephant trunk. So we're looking at how the elephant trunk moves to do some different things with conservation as well as robotics. So that's my my little intro. But Chase, tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, what you do with elephants and kind of where you've done some of your field work. And then we'll get into some nitty gritty questions. Sure. So uh, my name's Chase. I'm a PhD candidate in environmental science and policy at George Mason University. Um, I work now almost exclusively with Asian elephants, but I have worked with African elephants. So I feel like I'm qualified to say that Asian elephants are actually better than African elephants. Um, most of my work takes place in Sri Lanka, which is this tiny little island off the coast of India, and then also at zoos and other captive elephant facilities across the United States. I see Andrew's head shaking. I think my my stream's a little delayed, so all his reactions, I'll just have to roll my eyes at yeah, like 10 yeah. seconds after they occur. It's okay. African <laughs> elephants are just better. There's not really a source of debate, so you can just move, <laughs> yeah, okay. you can just move on from that. Okay. But uh, all of my research sort of focuses on understanding the basic biology and behavior of elephants so that we can better manage them, whether that's in the wild, thinking about managing elephant movements away from human activity, and then also how we can better care for them in captive settings like zoos. Awesome. So what is your, what is your main kind of research uh, focus? Will you talk some about kind of like what is your like what what is your dissertation going to be about so what is your thesis going to be in some of those things sure yeah so i study this unique reproductive period called must and it's spelled m-u-s-t-h but in english we pronounce it just the same as we would write it without the h so m-u-s-t <clears throat> it's this phenomenon that's completely unique to male elephants no other animal goes through something like it the the most similar thing is you may have heard of rut and species like deer they have a rutting season where the males get pumped full of testosterone and they're ready to breed something similar goes on with asian el or with elephants in general during must where they get pumped full of testosterone but there's not a must season like there is in um, animals like deer so elephants will go into must at different times of the year and it's basically this this way to sort of establish a dominance hierarchy so usually Bigger elephants are dominant over smaller elephants, but if an elephant's in must, that trumps any sort of size effect. So even a really small elephant that's in must will outcompete a really huge male that's not in must. So it's this really cool ecological behavioral phenomenon that we really don't know that much about, at least in Asian elephants. It was first described um, during ancient times, actually thousands of years ago, in places like India, where they used elephants as like beasts of burden, and must actually means intoxicated or drunk in Urdu, um, one of the ancient languages from uh, Asia, because when elephants okay. went through must, it was like they got drunk and they just completely forgot all their handler's commands and they could be really aggressive. Well, since thousands of years ago, we really didn't study must scientifically in elephants until around the 1980s, maybe late 1970s, when uh, Cynthia Moss and Joyce Poole out in Amboseli in Kenya noticed a phenomenon similar to must in African elephants, even though people thought only Asian elephants went through must. Well, they proved that no, African elephants do go through must, but um, since then, almost all of our study has been on African elephants for must research. So, what my research tries to pick up on is filling in all the gaps about Asian elephant must that we've known about African elephants for years. So I, I almost forgot, but uh, could you introduce the elephant in the Zoom? Uh, Chase, sure. have you seen a picture of? Yeah. So this is one of my favorite elephants ever. His name is Kevin. Um, <laughs> Kevin's just a name we gave him. We name some of our elephants in Sri Lanka that we see repeatedly just so it's easier to reference them. We give all the elephants we encounter numbers, but it's much easier to remember friendly sounding names than numbers. So this is Kevin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he is a male elephant. And in this photo, he's actually in must. So if you look pretty closely near the side of his head, there are glands on either side of an elephant's head called temporal glands. They're just like modified sweat glands, except they don't exude sweat. They exude a chemical 
that's called temporin, both in African and Asian elephants. And temporin consists of a bunch of different chemicals. For me, what's most interesting for Asian elephants is there's this pheromone in the temporin that basically signals to other elephants, hey, I'm in must, don't mess with me, females, I'm ready to breed if you are. <clears throat> and so that's one of the easiest ways just to tell if an elephant is in must by looking at it. So you can see these sort of dark stains on either side of an elephant head and you know that male is in must. African elephants do the same thing. So but Kevin's yeah, go ahead. Oh no, no. So with with must, right, you you said earlier it starts at a specific age. Right. So it doesn't like when they're born and they're like one and two, do they st do males still go through must? No. So it's sort of a sign of sexual maturity. So when, just like humans go through puberty, so do a lot of other animals. And for male elephants, at least one of those signs of puberty is must. So it's thought that in order to sustain the condition of must, it's really energetically costly. So if an elephant is in must, that means he's got really good body condition. And so that's one of the reasons we think must has evolved, because it's sort of a signal to females, hey, this male is really strong, he can maintain the must condition, he would be a really good person to make babies with, essentially. Gotcha. <clears throat> and so only older elephants will go through must. What's really interesting, and what we don't know for sure yet, but we're pretty sure just based on anecdotes, is that elephants in zoos will actually go into must much sooner than those in the wild because in zoos they get diets that are really rich in nutrients. And so their body condition is so good so soon in their lives that they can go into must as young as 10 or 12 years old. So what about, so for African Asian elephants, what is the time in the wild that they usually go through must? That's a good question and something we don't know because a lot of studies on must sort of focus on one population at a time. So you may That's study right. must in African elephants in Ambicellian, which is this one park in Kenya, or you may study it down in Addo Elephant National Park down in South Africa. And the research doesn't really get connected because you use different methods. Um, we think the most dominant bulls go into must right around the rainy season because that's when food is most abundant. And so if they go into must and eat a lot of food, they're ready to sustain must. We think, and again, we don't know either in African or Asian elephants, that if an elephant in must, is in must, he can suppress other elephants in the area from going into must just based on the pheromones he's exuding. It's another interesting area of research we're looking into. Um, <clears throat> but there's no distinct must season, so it'll happen one elephant after the other, sort of. So... I'm I'm curious because with Kevin over there, I don't see tusks and maybe I'm uh, so could you talk about like why? Because obviously African elephant males um, and uh, females both have tusks. And so I guess the premise of this question, talk a little bit about the differences. Uh, so Lynn talked about it last week and I know you said you watched it, but what are some of the differences to you between African and Asian elephants um, just in terms of anatomy and physiology and some of those things? Sure. So some of the easiest way for like a lay person to tell an African for an, from an Asian elephant is just to look at their ears. So African elephants have much larger ears than Asian elephants. And sometimes like educators will tell you if you squint kind of African elephant ears look like they're in the shape of Africa and Asian elephant ears look like they're in the shape of India. I don't know if I believe that, but maybe it helps some people. In this photo, you can actually notice that Kevin is multicolored compared to like an African elephant that's pretty monochromatic across its entire skin. So if you look at the edges of Kevin's ears, and he's covered in dirt, so it's hard to tell on his face, but on his face, he also has patches of pink. This is completely natural. Elephants can go through this process of depigmentation pretty early in life, even as young as three or four years old. But it actually is one of the ways we tell elephants apart from each other in the field, because these are completely unique to each elephant. Um, so it's a pretty easy way to distinguish them from each other in the field. But like you said, Kevin doesn't have tusks. Um, no female Asian elephants, or I should say almost no female Asian elephants, have visible tusks that extend past the upper lip. Some of them have smaller, what we call tushes, that don't extend past the upper lip, but they're pretty small and skinny, and they can use them to like prod each other with for social interactions. And then only some male Asian elephants have tusks. 
What's really unique about the male elephants in Sri Lanka, though, is that less than 10%, maybe even less than 5% of male Asian elephants in Sri Lanka have tusks. And so this is why Kevin doesn't have tusks. Um, in parts of India, these elephants are called maknas. Those are bulls without tusks. There are a few reasons that this may be true. So one of them is historical hunting. So Sri Lanka is or was a colonial sort of trading post where people would sail from Europe, go across to Far East Asia and go back and forth. And so this was a nice spot to sort of like park their ships. They may inventory what supplies they have, and then maybe they also go hunting for elephants. And so obviously they're only going to hunt for the males that have tusks. And so those elephants get removed from the population. They can't produce offspring. And it turns out that tuskedness, right, is heritable. So if your dad doesn't have tusks, you're not going to have tusks. So will you, Another thing is that real quick, Chase. Will you talk about what is what is heritable for? Because some people might not know the term. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm just a biologist spouting all of these words. I assume everyone. You're good. Knows. I'll, heritable I'll, I'll just... keep. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Yeah. So heritable just means it is um, able to be passed down from generation to generation based on DNA. So certain traits in humans, like hair color and eye color, we call them heritable because. If both your parents have brown hair, it's pretty likely you're going to have brown hair too. Well, one of the heritable traits that elephants have is whether or not they have tusks. So um, we call that trait heritable. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I was just going to say, so like a good perspective to think about it is, is you're a lot more likely to not be hunted if you don't have tusks. And so then you can pass your genes on to the next generation. And then eventually you have a large population in a specific region right because the elephants are um in a specific region that don't have tusks and i believe a few years ago they actually saw some african elephant males that were that um had uh did not have tusks yeah yeah i think in parts of southern africa um, yeah i'm not mistaken but i mean lynn and i talked about last week i mean and and so this is i guess the follow-up question is so africa right you when we're talking about things like negative human wildlife interactions with crop rating and these sort of things things can be completely different just even in border countries with elephants like ele- one thing like chili fences might work in place a but in place b it actually entices the elephants more to go through there so could you talk about just kind of looking at asian elephants as a species what are some of the differences and challenges throughout asia in terms of things like conservation and like human wildlife interactions? Sure. So the biggest threat facing Asian elephants, and it's a little different from African elephants that are under severe pressure from things like illegal hunting, is that Asian elephants tend to live in places where the human populations are booming. So if you think about places like India, Sri Lanka is in a similar boat and other places throughout Southeast Asia, you have these rapidly expanding human populations. And so what used to be traditionally elephant habitat is now being converted for human use, whether that's places for humans to live or more commonly for agriculture. And so what you see now are little pockets of Asian elephants. So what used to be this fairly continuous Asian elephant range all the way across Asia is now these isolated pockets. Um, And so obviously elephants evolved to sort of travel these long distances across their ranges And so now what we're seeing is as elephants are trying to move from pocket to pocket of safe or valuable habitat, they're running into conflict with humans. And so that's called human-elephant conflict. It also happens in places like Africa. But it seems like the rates of deforestation and habitat degradation that are happening in Asia are to the nth degree that's happening over in Africa. Well, yeah, because I would just say the when you look at the population density of the african elephant versus asian elephant ranges i assume i don't have the data in front of me but i assume right with african elephants they don't have a lot of as much of as far as i'm concerned interactions with it's with just like the public it's more of (laughs) with things like crop rating so you're going into a farm and rating the crops rather than i think people have probably seen a lot of viral videos of like literally you're just walking to work one day and there's a herd of elephants that's literally walking through 
And, um, and yeah, so will you talk about like the challenges of developing, um, conservation initiatives with like barriers? So like Lynn last week talked about chili fences and bee fences. Could you talk about some of the common things for that in, uh, in with Asian elephants? Sure. So it's important to realize that Asian and African elephants, even though Asian elephants are so much better, they're very different from African elephants. They evolve, they split, their evolutionary lineage split thousands upon thousands of years ago. In fact, the Asian elephant is more closely related to the woolly mammoth than it is to the African elephant. And so that means a lot of the things that may work in helping to conserve African elephants won't necessarily work with Asian elephants. And so, for instance, beehive fences, which have been shown to be effective in a lot of parts of Africa, may not work the same way in Asia or in certain parts of Asia because elephants haven't evolved to have the same relationships or the same fear of bees that a lot of African elephants have evolved to have this fear of bees. Um, a lot of the work going on in Asia with beehive fences now is being conducted by the people who pioneered the beehive fences in Africa. And so what they're learning, I think, is that it's not directly transferable just because the species are so different. Their behavioral ecology is totally different. So if you think about African elephants, the classic documentary picture is that African elephants are matriarchal and the females make these really close-knit groups among their female family members and they sort of travel for life together. Well, Asian elephants inhabit totally different landscapes that are full of forests, and so they don't form those large groups. Females form close relationships with their female relatives, um, but they travel in smaller groups. So maybe a couple elephants can more easily raid crops compared to a larger group of African elephants. And they form, Asian elephants form temporary relationships with each other, especially compared to African elephants that have this rigid sort of hierarchy. So you, you mentioned the behavioral ecology is different between the two. So could you kind of talk about what do you mean when you say behavioral ecology of like a species, something like the elephant? Sure. So ecology is just the study of the interactions between living organisms and their environment. And so part of animals' environments are not only the physical things they interact with, like food, water, trees, rocks, the physical landscape, but also each other. So your herd mate is part of your environment. Your relatives are part of your environment. So as behavioral ecologists, we're interested in studying the behaviors that sort of mediate the interactions between animals of the same species, so like elephant to elephant, but then also between different species, so like an elephant versus a predator or an elephant versus another species it competes with. And so a lot of behavioral ecology is studying the social relationships between animals. And so for an animal like an elephant that's so large and cognitively complex, that's so smart, those relationships tend to be really complex too. So you may think about a simpler organism, maybe a fish or a reptile or amphibian. The relationships it has with other animals are pretty simple to describe. They pretty much want to get together for breeding and that's it. Well, it turns out animals like elephants form these really rich social relationships with each other that will also impact how they navigate their environments. And so that's really important to take into account when we're thinking about ways to mitigate human elephant conflict, because we, we can't just take this elephant in isolation and be like, oh, well, this elephant, we just got to make sure it doesn't want the food on the other side of the fence. Well, that elephant also has other social relationships that it's considering as it's navigating the landscape. Maybe it's a mother taking care of her offspring and the only way she's going to be able to produce enough milk to feed her offspring is to go forage on those nutritious crops on the other side of the fence. So she's going to take that risk. Well, or and they're so smart. Yeah. And, and right. it's, it's like, that's the challenge. I think a lot of people don't realize, and I don't remember if I talked about this a lot, but like when we were doing some experiments in the Atlanta zoo, uh, like was talking with the keepers there on how long it would take to do a training right? Like just an enrichment training. And it took like 30 seconds. And yeah. for a mice experiment, it took like two weeks of like constant training and reinforcement and and those types of things. And so it was just kind of beating. Um, at the, it, it was frustrating with how intelligent they are at times. Um, but that's, that's one of the big issues with the conservation sort of stuff is right. Some things like, oh, you just put this in the water might work for a species. But when they're so smart and they have these social groups and social circles they can really 
outsmart a lot of things, which has been really cool. And there was actually, I think, just a publication I saw, I think, about like how they can use water for, did you, yeah, it was so cool. They can use water to, to like accomplish tasks, like to solve puzzles. So I, I didn't get to read the whole thing. Yeah. But. In ways that like we as humans are amazed by. So the, the um, paper you're talking about, I'm pretty familiar with because some of those elephants are also some of my elephants. Um, but essentially what they did is they gave elephants these clear plastic tubes that were too skinny for an elephant to just reach its trunk into and pull out a treat. But they also gave the elephant access to water. And so the way they get the treat is they get water, suck it up their trunk, go over to the tube and spray it into the tube and the treat floats to the top so they can grab it. It's something that I don't think I would ever figure out. Turns out chimps can figure it out too, but their intelligence is also beyond me. But yeah, yeah, just they, like chimps, elephants, corvids. I mean, all some of some animals are just just so intelligent, and that's that's one of the big challenges of finding something. And, and we talked about this with Lynn, and right, you can't. There's not really a one size fit all uh, solution, right? Because throughout Africa. Every single elephant is different. Uh, every single elephant like population is different. And if they, you know, are afraid of bees or not afraid of bees, and then you translate that to African forest elephants and it's completely different. And then you translate the, to Asian elephants and it's completely different. And it's, I mean, this is kind of one of, I think the big challenges is you're almost working with not just, you know, three species, but you're working with like so many individuals in each one of those that all have different preferences. Right, um, and they're these really long lived animals that have this, these decades of experience that is so much different than the other elephants it surrounds itself with. And it's these experiences that we have no idea with. Maybe these elephants have already encountered farmers before and they know how to get around all the deterrents we're thinking are completely new to them. And it's something that makes working with elephants so challenging. So I, Asian elephants can get over a hundred years old, right? Isn't that hasn't that been documented? Uh, or? No. <laughs> okay, it's not okay. What is the what is the age of? Um, it's that's a complicated question, and it's one where Asian elephants are much harder to follow throughout their lives than African elephants. I'm talking about the savanna species, just because it's it's much easier to follow elephants in the savanna compared to a forest. From captive elephants, we know, though, there are some captive elephants in U.S. zoos that are in their 70s right now, and that's probably would never happen in the wild just because once elephants get too old, their teeth literally wear out and fall out of their mouths, and so they have no way to eat. But in okay. captivity in places like zoos, we can grind up their hay, and so it makes it easier for them to eat. Tooth care, and yeah. it's Right. And so in the wild, we'd say an elephant that has reached 50 is probably geriatric. I see. Well. Um, well, with that, uh, with the geriatric term, could you talk about what, what does geriatric mean when it comes sure. to like zoological owl species? Sure. So it, it means it pretty much the same thing it means when we're referring to humans that are undergoing geriatric care. Towards the end of any animal's life, their body systems just start gradually failing. And so for elephants, that can mean their teeth start wearing out. So elephants are really cool because they have six sets of teeth. We have two, elephants have six. And instead of being pushed down from top to bottom, they actually come in through the back of their mouth and they're called marching molars because they march towards the front in small little pieces. Is that well, a technical probably. term? Is it literally marching molars? Or is that heard, a chase term? I read it in is textbooks. A... <laughs> okay. No, I didn't come up with it. I'm not taking credit for that. But once it's gone through six sets of teeth, it's out. It has no way to grind up its food. And the process of grinding food is really important for an animal that eats these rough plant matter. And so one way we can take care of these geriatric elephants in human care is by literally putting their hay through this like chopping machine that grinds it into fine little particles so an elephant can eat it. Um, other things is that elephant feet are under an immense amount of pressure. Andrew, you could probably talk about the physics behind that a lot yeah. better than I can. But that also means... After 50, 60 years, those feet have been through a lot, and so they need specialized care, and so that's another part of geriatric care. It would, yeah, I mean, the the elephant foot care is actually completely fascinating to me. I mean, I've I've gotten to see foot care routines in um, so, but I mean, elephants range and they walk so much throughout their life. It's like wearing down a shoe, and so right, eventually, 
if you think of putting on a really nice shoe and they go, oh yeah, this lasts 10 to 15 years. Well, when you have no sole and you're basically walking and the only thing that the shoe is anymore is just the top part of the shoe, right? It starts to degrade some things underneath your feet when you're going on things like rocky terrain and things can actually get like lodged inside their feet. And yeah, there's a bunch of, um, but Also, I mean, when you think of an elephant, it's kind of like elephants, rhinos, hippos. You have these animals that have like, I don't know, they look kind of funny with how short their limbs are. But the reason they have to be that way is because they can't really have things like like technical knees, because Mm -hmm. if you have that, if you ever bend the knee, you have so much weight going through that, then it then it's a useless it's a useless limb. So, yeah, they're they're really fascinating plantar grades so right and so like elephants joint issues tend to be a problem when an elephant gets older just like joint issues in humans happen and elephants can even get arthritis just like people can yeah so uh the next i think the next some stuff i'd like to talk through is i think both you and i so lynn hasn't done a ton with uh zoological house species so could you talk a little bit about why zoos are important um what uh, zoo stuff that you do with your research, just a little bit um, of that. And then I can go into some of my experiences with Zoo Atlanta. So sure. so my, my elephant experience sort of starts in the zoo. I went to college right across the street from a zoo. And doggone it, I was in that zoo five or six times a week in the elephant barn, just volunteering because I loved elephants so much. And so I owe a lot of my early experiences learning about what it is to be an elephant from zoo elephants. And one of the reasons I think they're so valuable for researchers is especially when it comes to Asian elephants, for zoo elephants, you can track them from birth until death. We know all the elephants that zoo elephant has ever met. We know exactly what that elephant ate throughout its entire life. In many instances, we have body measures, so things like blood tests and weights that we can track throughout an elephant's entire life. Whereas in the wild, say in Sri Lanka, I see an elephant out in the field I start recording data immediately, and then that elephant starts to wander into the forest. And as soon as that elephant gets 10 feet into the forest, it's gone. Like, I cannot see it. It becomes hidden. It's sort of counterintuitive to think this huge animal can just disappear so easily and so quietly. But that's where zoo elephants are really, really important for advancing scientific research. Not only that, but you can train zoo elephants to undergo a lot of things so that we can understand how their mind works. So a lot of cognitive tasks we can train an elephant to do to understand how it's perceiving the world around it or judging different amounts of things or what sort of senses it's relying on more than others. And we can use these captive studies to sort of complement the wild studies because obviously the zoo environment is not what elephants evolved to live in. Even if we kept elephants in zoos for 200 more years, the process of evolution probably would still have 200 more years to catch up before elephants have truly adapted to a zoo environment. But if we take those fine scale measurements we can get in zoos and use them to inform how we understand elephants in the wild, that sort of complementary process I think is really valuable. Yeah. And, and, and just to kind of talk about some of that even more, right, is some of the abilities that we can have in terms of doing. So you talked about like training for cognition and like these different types of there's also just very simple things like training for blood draws so if you look at something like a wild elephant right a lot of times if you ever need to get blood drawn for any sort of reason to figure out oh hey this animal is possibly has arthritis right then what you have to do is you can figure some of those things out in the um in zoological house species and then apply that to if chases in the field, making an observation. It's like, oh, something's fishy, right? Well, you can, you have a, and we talked about this yesterday, but you have like a controlled environment, right? Where you're able to actually uh, go through and do that. So, and yeah, I mean, just to echo, I mean, all the, all the things you said is, I mean, that's one of the things that's one of the coolest parts to Atlanta. Just an example they do, it's called the grade eight part project. And they're actually able to help both, uh, gorillas as well as humans with heart disease by understanding and that's uh that benefits because gorillas suffer from heart disease just like humans so it's really fascinating so so to, you mentioned some of it uh in uh in that so would you tell everybody like how did you get to where you were like what is your journey to become this 
uh, you said that a little bit of you, you know, you grew up uh, right across the street or was it grew up or went, yeah, you grew up or went to college right across. So how did you get to be a elephant scientist and um, how, how, sure. how did you get to do field work and some of these sort of things? Sure. So I grew up obsessed with elephants and I tell people I was just too stubborn to do anything else. So I, I went to Asia when I was in high school, went, almost went to Africa in high school, but that trip got canceled. Um, but I, when I was looking for colleges, I was looking for programs that had a strong undergraduate basis in animal behavior. I found a school up in Buffalo called Canisius College, just happened to be right across the street from the Buffalo Zoo. Started working in the elephant barn there. When I was looking for summer internships closer to home where I'm from in Texas, I got an internship at the Dallas Zoo for elephant research. I already had experience taking care of elephants in a zoo. And so the research world I sort of slipped into pretty easily because I think a lot of zoo elephant researchers would really benefit from taking a walk in a lot of these keepers' shoes to understand how they take care of their elephants. So I think that's really benefited me. And I started actually studying my undergrad just with surveys I would send out to zoos because I was really interested in how elephants are going through muss in zoos compared to what's been written about them in the wild. And so I, I built this network of contacts um, with all the zoos I was learning from. Um, and so when it came time for my master's degree, I got my master's with the same guy Lynn got her master's with a guy named Dr. Bruce Schulte out at Western Kentucky University. Um, I told Bruce I was really interested in muss and he's like, that's great but we also need to understand what's going on with their sensory perception. So here was me, a student trained in animal behavior, had avoided chemistry pretty much my all, whole life. And he was like, you're going to study chemical communication. And I was like, oh, I just dread. I, I don't know anything about chemistry. So for a year, I, I brushed up on organic chemistry by myself. And we really learned a lot about how Asian elephants use pheromones, including the ones that musk males produce to communicate with each other. And so that was with a lot of zoo elephants across the country, all the way from California to New York and pretty much every place in between. <clears throat> then when it came time for my PhD, I had even more contacts to work with. I wanted to get back to the fundamental must question. And so that's what I did. And so now I work with Asian elephants, like I said, in Sri Lanka, um, getting into the field. I'd been to Africa a few times studying African elephants on a the few smaller The best elephants, projects. yeah. <sighs> We'll agree to disagree. Um, and then I'd also been to Asia a few times studying like semi-captive sort of camp elephants. Um, and so really this was my first time going into the field on my own. I wasn't joining another project that was already in progress. I literally from the ground up starting this project. So it's it's been a <laughs> big learning experience, but it's something I think is really valuable. And then so, also having zoo elephants behind me was really great. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's it's one of the things that's just been going over in my head over is the the fact that so I don't think it even applies to I think if anybody does any research with any animal that is um in a zoo, I think experiencing just a few days, if you will, as a keeper give you so much more of an appreciation for the work you're doing and like because a lot of times if you're doing these experiments and stuff like that all the keepers are volunteering their time mm -hmm. and they're delaying everything else that they have to do if they're doing enrichment trainings if i mean a lot of that stuff so it's really uh really cool that they're um will really, really able to do that and me i i mean i just was like a pseudo intern for a few months but i still i did the same thing on saturdays um and you really do develop a strong appreciation for all the work they do in, in caring and working on the conservation of the species. But uh, but yeah, I will I will agree to disagree with you on um, we, we can uh, we can have that conversation another time. But yeah, I, uh, I would like to at least lay out the reasons Asian elephants are better just really quickly. OK, One, there are much fewer of them, so they're much more deserving of our intention. There are 10 times more African elephants than Asian elephants Two. They are so much prettier than African elephants because of their all their depigmentation. And three, they make much cooler sounds than African elephants do. So I'll let you think about those and come up with rebuttals for next week. Okay. So, <laughs> so moving on. I, uh, so uh, Telegram and chat actually uh, so asked a great question. So in studying elephants, um, 
in uh, in Asia, have you encountered any language barriers when you're doing the research? And could you talk a little bit? And so I want this to kind of transition into, could you talk just some about what field work is to you? What is it like when you go into field work? And I will prepare you. The next question is going to be to talk about how COVID has impacted some of that stuff. So, so yeah, so. Sure. So Sri Lanka is like my favorite place in the world now because it's this like tiny forgotten island that has all these rich resources from beaches to mountains and jungles and everything in between. And they speak this language called Sinhala, which is considered an ancient language and it's only spoken in Sri Lanka. I should also say there are three official languages of Sri Lanka. One of them is English, one of them is Sinhala. And then in the north, a lot of Sri Lankans speak a language called Tamil, which is shared with some parts of India. The places where I work, though, and where a lot of elephants are located, they speak Sinhala. And so I went over ready for nine months of field work, and I knew no Sinhala because there's nowhere to take Sinhala lessons in the United States. And so the plan was to hire a university student from Sri Lanka to sort of be a field assistant and also act as a translator. And so we had a wonderful field assistant. His name was Sachinta. He was super smart. He was as he had recently gotten his degree in zoology from a university in Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lanka, if you get a degree in any of the sciences, you take all those classes in English. So they get really good at speaking in English, not only for casual things, but also to talk about science and biology. So that was great for my first stint. <clears throat> and but now the spoiler alert is I am now taking Sinhala lessons and committed to learning the language so that Yes, I'll probably still need a translator, but at least I can navigate the world by myself a little easier in Sri Lanka. So I do it over Skype with someone who's in Sri Lanka because I have still yet to find a, a Sinhala teacher over here. But all of my field work in Sri Lanka takes place in pretty remote areas. Sri Lanka is pretty small, just landmass wise. It's about the size of West Virginia, the state of West Virginia, which oh, wow. is a little bit bigger. But even so, it takes forever to get anywhere because even though there are paved roads in a lot of places, they're pretty windy and it's usually just one lane next to another passing each other without any sort of barrier. So even though my the capital, Colombo, as the crow flies, is pretty close to my field site, it takes 13 hours to drive there. So I'm pretty isolated where I am. There's no cell phone signal, no internet, which sort of freaked me out the first couple of weeks, but then I learned to embrace it because I meant... It meant I didn't have to answer emails or anything. Uh, no air conditioning. Uh, I stayed with a family who only spoke Sinhala. They cooked amazing food, but I never knew what I was eating. I just learned not to ask and just eat it because it was all good. Um, and then getting to what, Andrew, you wanted me to talk about. Tragedy hit Sri Lanka last year on Easter Sunday because there was a series of coordinated terrorist attacks. And I was in Sri Lanka under a Fulbright Fellowship, which is a program of the United States State Department. So as soon as that happened, they sort of yanked all of us out of Sri Lanka. And I had to stop my research just at the drop of a hat. Didn't get to say goodbye to anybody. Most of my stuff I had to leave back there. All of my samples are still back there. <clears throat> and so it was sort of this tragic thing. Of course, I felt for the Sri Lankan people because this really peaceful place, this really, this place full of people who really loved each other like it, it felt that way and also loved all the tourists who would come to see its beauty their sort of reputation was tarnished because of this horrible act it's not an accident horrible incident so the plan was to go back this summer and then COVID hit so i had a terrorist attack last year pandemic this year and so the plan is hopefully no other catastrophic event happens next year so i can get back to sri lanka with a little bit of Sinhala that I know so I can be a better scientist. So where do you, where, so are you starting in learning with things that are science terms with just converse, conversational terms? Like, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think of it in respect to, obviously we, you said there's no class, but like, where do you kind of start with learning and how are you learning? So the other challenging part is there is also no textbook. So everything I learn, I learn through conversations with my instructor who I found out about because she teaches, she works for the British embassy over in Sri Lanka and teaches a lot of their British officers Sinhala when they first get to Sri Lanka to start their jobs. So I told her my situation. I told her, hey, I'm researching elephants. I want to be able to navigate the world in Sri Lanka a little better when I go back. And so a lot, a lot of our examples, like learning different words or verbs or vocabulary has been centered around elephants. And so it, it's been really nice. 
a lot that's, of that's since, awesome. si yeah since Sinhala is an ancient language there isn't a there's not a lot of vocabulary for modern things like there's no word for train in Sinhala or computer or even teacher there's no Sinhala words so they just say it in English so some things are a little more convenient that way so with uh with how is that affecting a little bit of your research so are you mainly focusing these last years on um zoological owl species or uh what uh what what's kind of the difference there yeah so we when i got evacuated we took most of last year for me to visit a lot of zoos so there are 10 zoos yeah 10 zoos that are part of my dissertation research so in the interim i visited a lot of them and it the plan was to spend a lot of last spring visiting them but of course covid it's a heartless bitch, and so I didn't get to visit a lot of the zoos either, and I'm still not allowed to go to a lot of the zoos based on my university. So hopefully the travel restrictions ease. A lot of the zoos have been super nice. They're still collecting fecal samples from me, for me, not from me, for, for me, from the elephants, so that I can measure a lot of the hormones that go along when must. And then even some of them have been filming their elephants so I can observe their behavior just as I would if I was there live, I've been able to watch from my laptop, which has been pretty nice. But the rest of the time, I pretty much just sit at a desk and write surrounded by pictures of elephants to try and make me feel like I'm still an elephant scientist. Yeah, I have I have my my shrine. So so this is actually one of the things that I figured we could talk about next week. Um, but uh, I'll just go ahead and say now one of the funniest parts about being an elephant scientist is everyone for every gift that they ever give you if anyone finds something elephant themed they're like andrew needs this i have like an elephant cheese board uh yeah. i have like elephant toothpicks it's like all of these things that i'm just like someone's like oh yeah i found this at a garage sale and it had elephants on it and i don't know about you but i'm i'm nitpicky and so i'll be like oh this is totally an asian elephant's anatomy um, and I study African <laughs> elephants. Uh, maybe, maybe that's a little, li little much of me. But uh, my, that's uh, I think everybody has a collection yes, I... of elephant stuff. But what yeah, is that? I, I will not deny an African elephant gift from someone. But if I'm like going to a zoo and I want to have a zoo that has Asian elephants and I want a magnet from there. If the gift shop only has magnets with African elephants, I will not get it because yes, I, I do judge all the anatomy. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a weird, it's a, it's a weird, um, it's a, it's a weird sort of thing that, uh, I guess you, you experience, um, with some of that. So had a great question in chat. So while elephants are in must is the increase in aggression, one of the difficult things to deal with when studying it. Uh, the, Short answer is yes. The longer answer is we actually don't, <clears throat> it's hard to characterize aggression. So, so I talked about how musk was first discovered thousands of years ago by people that work directly with elephants. And so that's been observed with a lot of elephants, even today with elephants in zoos, because they're so pumped full of testosterone during musk, they can be more aggressive. At the same time out in Sri Lanka, I've seen these huge bulls, 30, 40 years old, draining from their temporal glands continuously, really in the heat of must. They join a female group. The females act like it's nothing. And they're even elephant calves crawling underneath these must bulls' legs. And the must bull doesn't seem to be aggressive. <clears throat> so for people, it seems like maybe elephants can be aggressive towards people during must, and we have to take that in consideration when we're driving around elephants or even getting out of the vehicle to collect a fecal sample or like that. But you and Lynn talked a little bit about this um, last week, but all elephants, just like all people, if they're in the right situation, can be aggressive. So you just always have to be careful. So, kind of going on top of that, what is what is the what is the thing that drives you the most nuts about elephants? That is like a con completely untrue. I'll tell you mine. I'll, I'll uh, but is it the it's puppy just, one? No, 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 that's that. Well, that's one. But the one that's for me, be and the reason is, is because even people in scientific realms think that it is a fact. And it's the elephants have 40,000 muscles in their trunk. And it was an estimation made by a French naturalist in like 1820 or no, no in 1720 or something like that. Well, observing the bones of an Asian elephant. <laughs> and so it was like, and he was, I, I'm forgetting, you might know the name, but it's the, 
uh, naturalists that discovered that African and Asian were two different species. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was like, he looked at a bone and he's like, they have 40,000 muscles in their (laughs) trunk and it's been cited now and it's just everywhere. And so on almost any talk presentation, et cetera, I give, I literally have the same slide and it's like trunk Mythbusters, and it could be, I'm not talking about anything. And that's the one. And I, the second one is the, uh, elephants look at people like, uh, like people look at dog or uh, people look at dogs, dogs look at people. Yeah. Whatever the. So what is, is that the one for you? I mean, that one does drive me crazy. And I tell my students about it all the time when I, when I go into my nervous system chapter, cause I teach general biology. And so they know I like elephants. So they bring that up and I always have to crush their dreams. Another sort of meme that goes around every couple of years, is there's a Photoshop picture of an African elephant with like pink tusks. And it's supposedly like rangers injected this elephant's tusks with pink dye so that poachers wouldn't kill it because the ivory is pink. And that that's just one impossible to do and two doesn't happen. And there are even like forest elephants have tusks that are have this pink hue to them. So just because ivory is pink doesn't mean people don't want it anymore. Yeah. But I think the biggest misconception for me and what drives me crazy whenever I'm like observing elephants at a zoo and I hear like this super nice, well meaning educator come up and talk to people about elephants is that it's totally different living among elephants. And judging how you're going to respond to elephants living throughout your daily life compared to us in the Western world, where we have sort of extirpated all the large animals we live with and sort of fenced them into nice little preserves. And so we really can't judge the way that people may react towards an elephant raiding their crops when that's their whole year's livelihood and just condemn them for doing that and expect them, hey, don't hurt that elephant, but we don't have a solution to fix the problem yet. We and, and and that's the and that's and that's the whole the gentle giants thing I think that I talked to Lynn about is right a lot of people are like oh my gosh it's like 10,000 pounds it's so cool and it's like well if you have a house you don't necessarily want a 10,000 pound animal to be able to access your windows at all and right. so there's just these different aspects to understanding and you're i mean the what what is the largest mammal we have a land mammal i assume would be a grizzly in the united states yeah or maybe a bison maybe a bison yeah i but um but yeah it's just a different i mean it's a different scale i mean you're talking about 200 kilograms instead of 2000 or 5000 kilograms and so some of these uh some of these different things are um but, you know, the biggest elephants are the best elephants. So anyway. Uh, but yeah, 10,000 10, yeah. pounds of anything is dangerous. 10,000 yeah. pounds of rocks sitting there is dangerous. And so these people have to live with elephants throughout their daily. I mean, in the parts of Sri Lanka where I have to work, where I have to, where I get to work. I mean, kids have to walk to school every day. There isn't this well-established transportation system. And they're walking right through elephant habitat this these single kids or maybe these siblings walking to school together. And it's a real fear. Am I going to encounter an elephant? And if so, what's this six, seven year old kid going to do to be able to protect themselves. And so I, this is like the harsh reality. A lot of these communities are facing. And it's, it's tough because you don't want to be too doom and gloom because you want people to help the conservation efforts. But at the same time, it's really important that people realize the lens that they're looking at the end. So that's why things like the, yeah, it's uh so I I've like beat around the bush on it a few times but like what the phrase is is it's like is it true that elephants look at humans like humans like think of dogs and it's like first off scientifically how would you ever show that like how would you ever be like okay I'm going to take like a face ID picture of like and so it's just this really difficult thing and the uh, the other part is um and i hope we can have josh podnik on a future one to talk about because he has talked a lot about the are elephants afraid of mice and i think there's a lot of these myths and um yeah there's just a lot of difficulties surrounding a lot of because there's so many elephant myths there's the one that what a alligator got stuck in an elephant's trunk there a snake got stuck in an elephant's trunk and then bit it and then like climbed out of its mouth i mean there's literally i mean it's got to be, it probably doesn't have the most memes about it. That's probably the panda, but, um, 
we don't need to get into that. So we have another, could it potentially be that they are realizing that other elephants are part of the herd and will only tend to be more aggressive to either other musting bulls or other animals around them? Sure. So one of the things I haven't mentioned about must yet is that male and el- male and female elephants live almost completely separate lives until it's time to reproduce. And so must is sort of that signal from a male to a female, hey, I'm ready to reproduce. Let's do this thing. And so a female won't let a male into their group unless he's in must. And so there's no sort of long-term relationship that's happened between a female and a given male that approaches when he's in must. But it's something about that signal that, oh, that elephant's here to breed. Maybe, hey, we don't have any breeding females, or hey, that's the breeding female over there. That they sort of know what to expect. Either they've learned it in their own lifetime, or they've sort of evolved that response over generations. So I don't think it's that they know each other because male and females live separately, but I think it's sort of either an evolved or a learned response to know why that elephant is here because of the chemicals or the sounds he's making. So will you talk a little bit about how like the, I don't know if they're called herds with Asian elephants because they're smaller, but will you talk like about maybe what it's like to grow up as a male elephant, like what happens? So do you like start with the mother? And then is there a point where you get kicked out? Something like that? Sure. So uh, you, a lot of people may have heard that females invest a lot into their babies just because they have such a long pregnancy. And then female elephants nurse for their offspring for three or four years. So that that baby elephant is really dependent on that mother for a long time. And that female has invested a lot into the survival of the offspring, not only during pregnancy, but also after the elephant is born. So whether or not you're a male or a female baby elephant, you're going to be with your mom for the bare minimum five years, just because you need her to feed on. Then as you're growing up, um, you're going to start getting bigger and bigger. You're going to start eating foods on your own and start getting weaned off your mom. Male elephants tend to start getting really rowdy with each other and then even with adult females in the herd when they're around 10 or 12 years old. And that's sort of when they get kicked out of the group, either physically, I've seen females kick elephants out, male elephants out, or just sort of like it's this shared understanding maybe that it's time for the males to sort of forge their own path. And so it was assumed for a really long time for both African and Asian elephants that males are just solitary from that point on for the rest of their lives. And their own, when they come into must, that's when they are social again, or at least some form of social. Well, it turns out that it was first shown in African elephants that males are still very social animals, maybe even more social than females. When they get kicked out of the herd as young males, um, a lot of them form what we call bachelor herds with each other. So these are, these are not as tightly connected as female herds are, but it, they still learn a lot from each other. And they even learn from older male elephants that sort of keep them in line. And we're starting to think that male Asian elephants sort of form the same groups. At least in Sri Lanka, we've seen younger males who aren't in must associate with each other in what we would call sort of this group-like thing. But when they're in must, all bets are off. They don't want to associate with another male because that's a potential competitor. And then as a male gets older, he spends less and less time with other male elephants out of must, and he becomes more solitary. Females, on the other hand, they're pretty much going to stay with their mother and maybe a few aunts, so their mother's relatives, for the rest of their lives. Yeah, and and that's, I think, one of the interesting things that a lot of people don't realize is when they see those insanely big elephant herds, it's like all females. Right. Yeah. And, and, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to... You're absolutely right. And in some places in Africa, and even like a lot of parts of Botswana, they have huge aggregation of bull elephants. So like uh, Kate Evans sort of pioneered the work in Botswana on male elephant sociality. She observed groups of 100, 150 male elephants all congregating around one spot with no females present. So I think there's still a lot to learn about the lives of male elephants. Well, and Lynn, one of the, I think, fascinating things she talked about is this idea of problem individuals and so i'm curious have you seen any or heard anything like that in like the asian elephant population are there are there individuals that are problem animals that are causing 
um, possibly like more uh, having more negative human wildlife interaction and then teaching because you talked about the old bulls keep them in line and then possibly teaching some of these bachelor herds. Yeah, so in Sri Lanka, at least, that's where I'm most familiar with in Asia. The government or even local communities have termed elephants that repeatedly crop rate as problem elephants. And of course, the first thought is, okay, well, let's just move the problem elephant somewhere else. Well, it turns out another elephant will just come in and take its spot. So that's probably not the best strategy to do. And so I think a lot of the the way we're going towards sort of conservation-based behavior approaches to solving human elephant conflict, or at least mitigating human elephant conflict, is to understand how much of these behaviors are learned. So are they learning it or being taught it? Or is it being shaped by other individuals? Or is it sort of just part of their personality? Because we now know that elephants have distinct personalities, sort of like people have distinct personalities. And so um, this sort of propensity to engage in risky behaviors like crop rating is a huge possibility that may be compounded by the fact that either there's not a big adult bull to keep them in line, or maybe they're learning it from the big adult bull who's big enough and is willing to take the risk enough to go raid crops. And that's the, and that's the thing, right? Is, is you, you think of some of these smaller bulls going through must the first time right i mean you're looking at what the older males are three times the three times the mass two times the mass at least yeah i'd say about two times yeah two times yeah and what's super interesting too that asian elephants do another reason i like asian elephants so much and it has to do with must is that asian elephants but not african elephants when they go through their first or maybe their first couple must episodes they make completely different chemicals that they're exuding from their temporal glands. And we call that moda must or sort of semi must. And must bulls, I mean, you know, from Masholo down in Atlanta, they smell horrible. You can't get must urine out of clothes for weeks. But when moda must exude their chemicals, they actually smell a lot like honey. So they're really sweet smelling. And so we think maybe it's their body's way of preparing themselves to go through all the physiological changes that occur with must. But it, at the same time, they're signaling to other elephants, hey, hey, it's just my body getting ready. Please don't take me as a threat. I'm not prepared to defend myself if another musk bull comes by, which I think is really neat. So one of the other things I think is absolutely amazing is, so for me, a lot of the elephants I've worked with are females. Um, and so Zoo Atlanta, we have uh, three elephants, um, Kelly, Tara, and then Misholo. And so Kelly and Tara are 30, gosh, I think 37 now. And Mish is like 30 years old, but he weighs like 2000 more pounds. And so, so I think a lot of people also don't realize like bulls are huge and especially like African bulls, uh, I'm sorry, African bush elephant bulls because African forest elephants are smaller, but like are insane. Like, I think there's, there's a, I'm forgetting where it is. I think it's in the, um, that the history museum in London or no, no, it's not in, it's in Smithsonian. They have a bull that I think Teddy Roosevelt might've shot or something like that in 1908. That's like a 14 foot tall bull. Yeah. And, and so just, I, yeah, being close to DC, I go to the museum a lot and it's just amazing. Of course, the taxidermy. Shacks. Yeah. is like, just think about that two shacks on top of each other. And that is how tall that bull is. And, I've worked in free contact with a lot of bulls, both Africans and Asians. And it's totally different being in a vehicle studying elephants or even being at the zoo and watching from afar. But when you're like standing inches away from them, I can, I know multiple elephants now who I have literally walked underneath their chin and I'm like, what, five, eight or something. And there've still been a few inches of clearance above my head. And that's just their lower chin. And they've got what, like three or four feet of head above that. And it's just amazing. Yeah. And so like, so sexually dimorphic, like is one of the fancy words that basically means that like what males and females are different in -hmm. terms of they have like physiological differences in terms of weight and, and stuff like that. Whereas other animals, they might be very, very close to the, um, to the same, same size. Yeah. There, but I asked another, um, question at the end. And, uh, I think this is actually one of the most common ones I get is the 
um, elephants tend to mourn and have, uh, so I think there's this aspect of kind of elephant funerals that a lot of people talk about. So do you have any experience in, in like kind of, I, I know you have definitely heard it before cause it's super common, but do you have any mm-hmm. experience like with any information on something like that? I actually just reviewed a manuscript on elephant mourning and forest elephants. So I, I read a lot about that literature recently. I would say that elephants are a lot like humans, and we like to ascribe a lot of the same emotions we have to elephants. And elephants definitely pay a lot of attention to their dead relatives. So elephants seem to, after years, come back to the bones of their dead relatives and manipulate them a lot more so than non-related elephants, and then obviously a lot more than, say, the bones of a giraffe or an antelope or something like that. (laughs) Whether or not they mourn would be very difficult to say. Elephants definitely can't cry. So there's no, elephants don't have tear ducts the same way we do to cry or anything like that. But they do seem to pay special attention to dead relatives or dead conspecifics. Will you, will you talk a little bit about just anthropomorphism and what that means and just kind of from a behavior perspective? Sure. So anthropomorphism is just a big word for saying ascribing human qualities to animals. And so sometimes it can be pretty helpful to anthropomorphize animals like elephants because we can explain a lot of their behaviors based on how we would respond to a similar situation. The problem with that is obviously there are a lot of assumptions that go along with anthropomorphism that right now at least we have no way of scientifically testing. And so, for instance, we talked about zookeepers and zookeepers are like the biggest superheroes in the world, but one of the reasons they might not be the best at Um, at scientifically describing their behavior in the way that maybe I would is that they spend so much time with the animals. They're like family members and they'll be like, oh, Misholo is happy today. So he's going to do really well on this cognitive test or, oh, Kelly's just pissed off today. Don't worry about it. She'll be better tomorrow. And so we know that elephants can have their on days and off days, but whether or not that's because of emotions like happiness or sadness or frustration, it's really hard to tell And it could be true, right? I mean, it could be. And this is part of the difficulty of this, right? Is, I mean, that is, we don't know. We just don't, that's the issue is there's not like a, Chase and I are going to be able to, you know, we're not elephant whisperers because we've talked so much about how elephants are different in every single place, right? And so the same thing goes where you might observe a behavior in a and then it means something completely different when you go somewhere else and so just like like i don't know there's probably some people who really enjoy chewing with their mouth open and some people that it drives them absolutely insane and so just like um those sort of things and trigger different responses but yeah that's 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 the hardest part of describing things i find is the line of where you use that to help you communicate it without diminishing i guess the i don't want to say like the science but without diminishing like what's actually happening in terms of the behavior and so as as an animal behavior scientist i've been trained to describe what i'm seeing in objective terms so i don't ascribe any even aggression is a behavior i don't use i would rather describe the specific acts or behaviors that happened in the incident and then maybe after collecting data over and over again and I can show in this instance, the elephant is going to respond that way. Maybe one of the next hypotheses is this is aggression or this is out of frustration or something like that. And maybe the only logical way is to point towards an emotion that's similar to a human emotion. But where you start at is describing the behavior in objective terms. And so far with the cases of elephants in mourning, I don't think we're there yet to say this is the elephant is feeling sad. But what we can say is the elephant at least shows more interest and dead family members than a lot of other animals do. Yeah, and I I think that's sort of the comparative nature of it, right? You're wanting to Mm -hmm. compare it to not just all animals, but maybe similar species in terms of cognitive ability and and these different sort of things. And Bubba asked kind of a question about maybe just emotions in general is, um, like, do elephants have facial expressions, body language? Could you talk (sighs) some about some things like that? Sure. So they don't have facial expressions although if you look at an elephant just the way their trunk and mouth is shaped it sort of always looks like they're smiling but that's the way elephants always look um they don't really have 
ways to distort any sort of facial features like we would to show emotion. But there are definite signs that if you're going to work with elephants, you got to be able to recognize. So something like excitement or arousal, they're going to, their head's going to perk up, uh, especially in African elephants, they're going to flap their ears, their ears forward. And maybe that's a sign of alertness. If there's danger nearby, hey, look how big I am, you might want to back off. Um, even things like their tail, watching an elephant tail can tell you a lot about the sort of behavioral state of an elephant. If it's high up and erect, that means it's on alert. If it's sort of just swishing behind its back, that probably means the elephant's pretty calm. So there aren't facial features, but there are different, definite ways to tell sort of what's going on inside an elephant just by looking at its body language. Well, and one of, one, one of the fascinating things, one of my favorite fun facts about elephants is the fact that they're basically left or right trunked, mm -hmm. if you will, where they have a preference and it's it's funny because people are like, oh, this is such BS. And then you like start to observe an elephant and you're like, oh, they're always going to their right side. And one of the mm -hmm. ways um, for those that are watching that can you can tell is usually by the tusks. So this is probably a lot harder in Asian elephants to just do in a snap by observation. But with African elephants, they'll tend to basically one side a lot more than the other. And so that tusk is usually wear down more. Um in the wait or did i get that backwards yes it's where the tusk that is wear down more is the side that they tend to go um to the trunk which i, I think just fascinating i forget the fancy word but it's like handedness but it's another yeah. it's another kind of difficulty with thinking of something like so a lot of the experiments i do we have to take into account right where we have to look at and we're wanting to do this in the future is actually look at the left and right side kind of like if you're looking to your left and looking to your right of these elephants that are described as maybe left trunked or right trunked. It's a, it's such a weird term because when I tell people that everyone's like they have one trunk, how can they right. be left? But it's, it's more of just like tending to, and there's not, there's not left-handed desks for elephants is I guess what I'm trying to say. Right. So. And I guess maybe a better way, or maybe if, if, the chat doesn't understand what's going on. If you watch an elephant in like a zoo eating hay, it's got a pile of hay in front of it. And before it just picks up hay to eat, it's going to like sweep it into a nice pile. And so it does that with its trunk. And so its trunk can either land on the ground this way, or it can land on the ground this way. And so which way, it, right, which way it curls is going to sort and of And they almost dictate. always curl the same exact way. Right. And, but un and yeah. But unlike go, people go. where most people are right-handed, it seems that 50, there's about 50. an equal split yeah. for elephants, yeah. And it's and I believe that was observed originally in Asian elephants, and then it's been translated to African. So this is actually one of the difficulties. Um, is so for so this is kind of the funny part about the argument of which elephant is better. And for me, the reason African elephants are, are so much better from my research, and they actually are a better species, is because they have the two fingers on the tip of their trunk, right? And so it's essentially, could you talk some about the, um, like, what is on the tip of, like, an, Af or an Asian elephant's trunk? And something I'm curious of, and I have no idea, is do you know how, like, where that evolved? Why yeah. African elephants have the two and Asian elephants have one? Yeah, and so I listened to that last week, and I, at least this is the way it's been explained to me. So African elephants are mostly browsers, which means they eat tree matter mostly, and Asian elephants are mostly grazers, like cows, so they eat mostly grasses. So like in Sri Lanka, I've seen an elephant eat one tree, like that's it, and most of the time they're just eating these tall grasses. And so and just an to, African elephant... Just to enter, is, is they're not like eating the branches. What what Chase means is they're basically like a giraffe does with its neck. They're eating the leaves and all of the nutrients that is above ground level. Just to clarify, go ahead. Go right. Ahead, so an African elephant in the wild might only eat the leaves, but zoo elephants will eat the branches too. <laughs> but uh, so an African elephant, when it's browsing, may need to pick something with two fingers like this, whereas an Asian elephant is grazing. So it like like I explained, the elephant eating hay at the zoo is going to sweep it up by curling its trunk and putting it in its mouth, so it's not going to need two fingers. At least that's what I've heard. Woolly mammoths also only have one trunk finger, and they're closely related to Asian elephants, so it may be this thing that goes back to their common ancestor. So, I don't know. That's just the way it's been explained to me. Yeah, but, but in, and, 
Uh, sorry. So I, I was just going to say, so like the reason it's interesting for my research, right, is you think of it's basically looking at an animal that has an opposable thumb versus one that doesn't. And so when you're looking at biomechanics and movements, it's like an extra level of complexity. But go ahead, Jason. Right. Yeah. So African elephants are just that much more dexterous. But that's not to say the Asian elephant trunk is useless because I have seen Asian elephants pick up like objects the size of quarters. So they're still pretty good at using it. But one of the reasons I'm super interested in the trunk is obviously because of its sense of smell. I didn't just ditch my master's project when I was done. I'm still super interested in how smell works because I think Lynn mentions this last week, but elephants are the best smellers of at least any of the mammals we know. And better, you than, better than dogs and the, right. their ability to smell TNT. They can detect TNT at a better rate than dogs. I mean, it's just the, the their uh, capabilities for, and what does it sniff? water from two kilometers away no it's longer than that i don't yeah it's it's hard to say yeah but um but actually i don't know i don't know that it's been studied in african elephants but at least in asian elephants when in, they've studied elephants that have died and looked at the trunk underneath a microscope there are tons of specialized neurons isolated that little finger at the end of an asian elephant trunk that are specifically specialized to pick up the pheromones that elephants are producing to communicate with one another which is really cool yeah, we, we I'm doing some dissections with an African elephant trunk and we're mm -hmm. looking at some of the skin and the hair and some of the and it's just it's like one of these things where it's just fascinating how cool they are and I will say um we I feel like at this point we're just competing which elephant's better but uh but but truth be told what's what's truly amazing as we talk through this stuff Chase is, is like to it's funny because I get the question all the time, how different are African and Asian elephants? And I feel like so many times people are just like, oh, yeah, it's like the ears and the trunk. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, right. no, there is. So literally, if you look at the skin of their torso, African elephant skin has these like little crack divots that they can fill in with water with all these things because they're not in humid en or in wet and humid enough environments to be able to cool and so they need that but you look at and so everything is just so different whereas things are a lot more similar i would i mean i don't think we would argue about it at all between bush elephants and forest elephants but it's just the differences between the two species are just so vast it's kind of like a i give like answers and they're like yeah i i just i just was asking they, like for two right they just want to know the ears thing yeah. But I, I have two more points to add to that. One is that to really drive home the point about how distantly related African and Asian elephants are from each other is that lions and tigers are more closely related to each other than African, African and, and Asian, Asian elephants, elephants are. Right? And think about all the differences that lions and tigers have from each other. It's totally different socially. So tigers are solitary and lions live in the classical prides that we hear about. And the other thing that's really neat to think about elephant evolution and how the species are related is that African elephants sort of went down their own lineage and then eventually split into the savanna and the forest elephant, while Asian elephants were sort of on their own lineage over here. But the similarities between Asian elephants and African forest elephants are a lot closer than to bush elephants because they live in similar environments. So forest elephants obviously live in the forest, and most Asian elephants also live in forests. And so a lot of the social organization um qualities are similar between forest elephants and asian elephants size wise what? they're a lot similar and even their ears are more similar to each other than say an asian elephant to a bush elephant and and that's that's it's it's this kind of you see these graphics now and it kind of has the trend like it almost looks like one of those anamorph things where it's like <laughs> yeah. the um with the bush elephant and then the or sorry the forest elephant and bush elephant but yeah it is it is fascinating because really bush i mean obviously they're called african bush elephants that and so african forest elephants are the ones that live in forests um and you can kind of see the range if y'all just look up uh bush elephants and yeah i i think the other part that i'm just kind of excited about with these conversations is i'm just it's so weird because and I, there was probably some points that you were cringing last week but it really is so weird how little a lot of times the elephant, like, I don't know a lot about Asian elephants at all. Like, I know what an Asian elephant is. But I mean, even things like, and I should know the evolution of the finger. And I, I knew the grazers thing, but I wasn't sure if anyone had pinpointed. But I didn't know that well, um, woolly mammoths only had the one. But it's like this weird 
they're so different and they're in such different environments, right? Like, just like you said, like somebody that studies snow leopards and study someone that studies lions, right? Sure. They're both cats, but that's kind of what you got. So this, this is kind of one of the difficulties of the comparison nature. And yeah, I, I know some people in chat have been talking about we're elephant supremacists in terms of uh in terms of the difference between the species but yeah i mean there's there really is so m many different things when you look at every singular part of the animal um like elephant trunks are more wrinkled than asian elephants are and but they have uh asian elephants have more pigmentation like you said i mean it's just like over and over and over again so um uh, so we're to kind of wrap up some stuff uh here um and then i'm excited because next week is world elephant day Mm -hmm. so and it's on wednesday i was like is it going to be close and i'm like this is perfect so um we have world elephant day here next week but uh so one of the things i kind of want to end on is uh what i like to do when i talk about these things and i feel like lynn's was a little bit of what is a takeaway and hers was elephants like gentle giants so what is like a takeaway that any person that talks to you about elephants that you you is like want it could be like a fun fact or yeah. something along those lines that you want to take um that you want people to take away and it could just be something cool something that doesn't have anything to do with your research but uh what is what is your kind of takeaway uh it might be kind of sappy but i would say that out of all the things we've learned about elephants we know that they're definitely special like not only evolutionarily or because of their anatomy or because of biomechanics or anything like that there's these like super cool animals that evolved to be here and live in these complex ecosystems that they're a huge players of. Like you talked about keystone species last week, elephants really impact the environments where they live. And while we think they're super special from a Western perspective, and we really admire them as like these gentle giants or these really super smart animals that form these complex relationships with each other, we also have to realize that they're causing problems in a lot of places where they live. And so I know we've already talked about it, but that's sort of what I want people to keep thinking about is how would you respond to these elephants if you were living there? And a lot of the people in the communities where I work, they really love elephants. I ask people all the time when I'm just conversing with them, even non-elephant people like, so what do you think about elephants? And they all really respect them and think they deserve a place on this planet. But at the same time, they need, the humans need to survive too. And so that's sort of what I sort of, try to impress on other people is that yes elephants are super deserving to be here we should be throwing everything we've got to make sure they're going to be here for a lot longer but at the same time we need to be ensuring the people that have to coexist with them are also empowered to be able to survive alongside them so the last thing um mm -hmm. is so how can we save the elephants how can we <laughs> how can we save and it, obviously this is not a, but like, so what are some ways that people that are watching this um, can impact elephant conservation? I know you work with a lot of, um, actually we, uh, you, Lynn and I all work with a lot of uh, really great um, organizations. And so could you talk some about uh, some, uh, just some ways that people can make an impact on elephant conservation? Sure. So obviously the two or three of us we are not the only elephant people. There are hundreds of other people, maybe even devoting more of their lives to, uh, than us to making sure elephants survive. And so um, some of the groups that are my favorite, if you wanna support them that are doing great work are places like the International Elephant Foundation. If you've decided that Asian elephants are the superior species, you can donate to them or another group called Asian Elephant Support, which helps Asian elephants in range countries. Um, going to your local zoo, even if they don't have elephants, is really important because zoos support conservation efforts around the world. The price of the ticket helps not only take care of the animals you're going to see at the zoo, but also to the zoo's global conservation projects, including in places where elephants live. Um, and then also, of course, the don't actively contribute to the destruction of elephants or their habitats. So that could be don't purchase ivory, don't buy trinkets made from elephants. So it's not so much of a problem with Asian elephants, but now we're realizing that other parts of the elephants can be poached too. So yeah. skin poaching is a really big problem. It turns out in some parts of Asia, elephants can be killed for their skin and that skin can be either sold as a hide or made into 
jewelry or something like that. Boots, jewelry, yeah, right. anything. <laughs> and another big issue is palm oil in Asia. So palm oil plantations to produce palm oil need to destroy a lot of the habitat where elephants and other animals that you may like, like tigers and orangutans live. Palm oil is in pretty much everything you use, even if you don't realize it. So just making sure you're purchasing products that are made with sustainable palm oil. And we and we've talked about that some of there's a great palm oil app by the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo that mm -hmm. will tell you, you know, if you're uh, if the different products that you're buying, because like you said, one of the really important things to talk about with palm oil, and I think this is a great place to end is 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 not, not to boycott palm oil. A lot of people are like, oh, you must boycott. But just like you uh, I think you said earlier, right, is if you just uh, move one elephant, right, another one will take its place. So it's the same thing with these types of products, right? If it's a cheap product, well, there are places that are there are organizations and companies that are doing uh, sustainable palm oil where they're not uh, they're not impacting habitat uh, loss and fragmentation and, and these sort of things. And if you go into that app, if you scan a barcode, you can just look up something. It will let you know, like if they are a very big concern in terms of destroying habitats or they're not. So the point is not to boycott the product. It's more to be aware of what you're buying, where it comes from, and if it is impacting um, animals there. So thank you so much, Chase, uh, for no being problem. on.